Today we're going to talk about magnets, and we're going to start by talking about the different properties of magnets. So we've all played with refrigerator magnets before, and you probably know, and you've probably known since elementary school, that magnets have two poles. They have a north pole and a south pole, and that the opposite poles are going to attract each other. Uh, what you may or may not have known is that magnets will always have a north pole and a south pole. In fact, even if I were to break this magnet right at the seam right here, uh, what would happen is it would not be that I would get uh, just one magnet that was a North Pole and one magnet that was a South Pole. In fact, the two magnets themselves would each develop new poles. So that if I were to break the magnet right here in the seam, you'd get a North Pole on the farmost end, and then near the broken end, you'd get a South Pole. Uh, in the blue side, which was originally just a South Pole, you'd get a south pole at the far end and a north pole uh, in the center where it was broken. And this is a fundamental rule of magnets. It's that magnets always have two poles. I can never separate the poles of a magnet. You can never just have one pole. Uh, you can never just have a north pole by itself or a south pole by itself. The next rule of magnets is that like poles repel and that opposite poles attract. So that if I have a north pole near a south pole, those poles are going to attract. So here, uh, I've got the north pole of uh, the magnet uh, here facing up. I've got the south pole of this magnet facing up. So its north pole is facing down. Let's see what happens when I put the two north poles together. You can see there is a repulsive force between the two. And I can use that to push the magnet without even touching it. And in fact, you can see that even better if I force them, if I try to force the north pole of one magnet on top of the north pole of the other, you can see it just sort of balances right there uh, and that the, uh, the two magnets are repelling each other. Now, let's contrast that by taking the north pole of this magnet and facing it to the south pole of the other magnet. And you can see, even from a distance, there's a, an attractive force that pulls them together. Another property of magnets is uh, very similar to the electric force. The magnetic force is long range. So if I were to take a magnet here and put it next to a paper clip. Now, the paper clip by itself is uh, not magnetized. But if I bring a magnet next to it, there will be an induced magnetic moment in the paperclip. And even if I'm fairly far away, we can see I can attract the paperclip. Um, I suspect this is why little kids enjoy playing with magnets, because you have this unique attraction uh, that's long range. And what physically what this is telling us is that the magnetic field has to be similar to the electric force in that it has to operate through some kind of field. Otherwise, we wouldn't get this long-range attraction or repulsion between the two objects. While the magnetic force is similar to the electric force, there are some definite differences. For example, suppose we take a balloon here and rub it with fur so that it gets charged up with some static charge can hear that static charge there. Uh, if I were to if I were to take a magnet next to the balloon, you can see the magnet does not exert any sort of appreciable force on the balloon. So magnetism and electricity are definitely different uh, entities. I can't just have an electric charge that's static and attract it with a magnet. One of the well-known uses of magnets is in uh, compasses. So we know that the Earth has a magnetic field. In this case, north is pointing in a that way direction. And regardless of which way I rotate the compass, you can see that the north pole of the magnet is pointing in the same direction. Uh, the reason is that Earth has its own uh, magnetic properties, and it has its own magnetic field, which points in this, this direction, which my uh, compass magnet is aligning with. And the compass will continue pointing in that direction uh, no matter which way I try to rotate it, uh, unless I try to bring in some other magnetic field that's stronger than Earth's magnetic field. So if I were to 
bring in my um, my bar magnet over here, you can see that my north pole, uh, as I rotate it around, I can bring, I can drag that magnetic compass needle with me. And if I were to switch it to the south pole, you can see the compass needle flips around. Uh, give it a second to calm down. Calm down. Oh, that just made it worse. Uh, but whichever pole uh, on the magnet, so here we have the south pole, uh, that's going to face the north pole of the compass needle. And if I flip it around, you can see that the magnetic compass needle flips as well. So what have we learned so far? Well, we've learned that there's always two poles, and that even if I take a magnet and I break it in half, there will still be two poles, because the part that gets broken uh, on the north pole end would get a south pole on the broken end, and the south pole side of the magnet, once it's broken, the broken side will become a north pole. So we always have two poles. There's no way I can have a magnet that doesn't have two poles. The other things we know, and most of you have probably known this since elementary school, is that like poles repel, opposites attract, so that if I put two like poles next to each other, you know that there's going to be a force uh, from magnet 1 on magnet 2, and then an equal and opposite force from magnet 2 on magnet 1. However, if I put two opposite poles together, we're going to get exactly the opposite case, where force 1 on 2 will point toward uh, magnet 1. And force 2 on 1 will point toward magnet 1 so that the magnets are going to come together. We've also learned that magnetic forces are long range. So that if I have a magnet some distance away from an object, there's still going to be a force attracting those uh, two objects together, a magnetic force that pulls them together. Um, this tells us that magnetic forces have to interact through fields since they're non-contact forces. Additionally, okay, so that makes them like uh, electric forces, because they're non-contact forces that have to interact through fields. Uh, however, they're not exactly the same as electric forces, because we know if we take a balloon and charge it up, and then I bring a magnet next to it, there's not a net force between the two. So there's got to be uh, some sort of distinction between electric forces and magnetic forces, but there are some similarities as well. We can visualize the field created by a magnet uh, just by using a compass and seeing which direction it points. So right now, the field is pointing out uh, to the right, as you can see, because the compass needle is pointing to the right. And as I move it down, you can see that field is now pointing down and to the right. And as I drag it this way, we can see what happens to the field as we go down. You can see it appears to be coming out of that positive. And then as I trace it around, it's pointing in to the south pole, or negative, coming out of the north pole, I should say, and into that south pole. And the same thing is going to be true if I point to the top, uh, to the other side. You can see we have, uh, it's pointing into the south pole, still pointing into the south pole, into the south pole. And as I get further away, over here, it's coming out of the red north pole and into the blue south pole. If I trace it all the way back, you can see it just brings me back into that north pole. So magnetism works through non-contact forces, which means there's got to be some field that extends through space and describes that magnetic force. Uh, well, what is that magnetic field? Uh, well, it's going to get the symbol B. Uh, and it's going to get the unit Tesla after Nikolai Tesla. Uh, and that magnetic field, we can map out just by taking a magnet, the bar magnet, North Pole, South Pole, and looking at how the magnetic field affects a compass needle. So when we put the compass needle near the North Pole, it came out of the North Pole, and then it looked like it was pointing down, and into the South Pole. And if I trace these lines out, we get a picture of a magnetic field 
that looks like this. It appears to be coming out of the North Pole and into the South Pole. And much like electric field lines, magnetic field lines go on forever throughout all space. And they never cross. While electricity is not the same thing as magnetism, the two are very much related. So we have here just a normal everyday paper clip. Next to that, I have a nail that has been wrapped in copper wire, as you can see here, and connected to two leads of a battery. Now at the moment, the, uh, there is a switch that is off on the battery so that the, there is no current passing through the copper wire. And you can see that when I try to touch the nail to the paper clip, nothing happens. However, if I just go over here, just, let me just switch on the current. When we do have electric current, if I try to touch the paper clip, you can see instantaneously that my nail does get some magnetism to it. If I turn off that current, you can see the magnetism is mostly lost. There's a little bit of residual magnetism in here. There we go. Um, but uh, overall, we've lost the magnetism here, and I can no longer pick up my paper clip unless I turn on my magnet again. Let me do that one more time. You can see, again, I can pick up the paper clip. So by wrapping that copper wire around a, an iron nail and connecting it to a battery, we've created what's known as an electromagnet. And uh, what we found with that electromagnet is that when there is current, so when the battery is connected and on, uh, and only when there's current, uh, can we attract uh, the paper clip. Another way to think of this is to say that only when there is current, uh, electric current, uh, can we create a magnetic field that's going to attract that paper clip. So from this we can see that there's got to be some relationship between electric current and magnetic field. So we can say that electric current creates magnetic field. I want to emphasize this. Electricity is not the same thing as magnetism. The two are different physical phenomena. But they are related. How do we know that they're not the same thing? Well, when I took a magnet and I held it next to my charged balloon, the charged balloon didn't go anywhere. It didn't feel a force. Now, if I had held a charge and put it next to that charged balloon, there would have been some sort of force, either attractive if they were opposite charges or repulsive if they were uh, like charges. Uh, but my magnet didn't do anything. The only time I had any magnetic properties are when the charges were actually moving. So when I had electric current passing through the wire, that's when we got some magnetic effects. That's when I could attract that paper clip through magnetism. So electricity and magnetism can't be the same thing because magnets don't attract static charges in the same way that electric charges do. But we can say that uh, there is some relationship here because electric current, I, which is related to how much the charge, how fast the charges are moving, how many charges pass by per unit time, that creates an electric, or that creates a magnetic field. So moving charges create magnetic fields, but static charges, charges that are not moving, are just regular old electric charges. They don't have magnetic properties. They don't create magnetic fields. One way to enhance the magnetic field coming from uh, an electric current is to wrap the wire around in a coil. So here we have a coil of wire. This is known as a solenoid. Uh, and you can see the copper wire wrapped around the cylinder here. Uh, it's just a, an open cylinder, as you can see here. And I have attached 
to that coil, uh, the positive lead of a battery on one end and the negative lead on the other end. And over here I just have my uh, compass uh, needle. And at the moment you can see the compass needle is pointing north, uh, which is pretty much kind of up in you know, that way direction. Um, but let's see what happens to my compass needle when I turn on the, uh, the switch and connect that battery. You can see the compass needle uh, points toward uh, the pole of the electromagnet here, uh, of, of the solenoid. And as I move it around, you can see the, the needle is going to point in pretty much the same way that the uh, at, that it did for just the, the bar magnet. So you could imagine that we have a north pole on one end and a south pole on the other end, and as we get closer and further away, that needle flips so that the north pole of the compass needle is always pointing to the south pole of the solenoid. We can create more magnetic field by looping the wires into a coil uh, of wire. And that's what's known as a solenoid. Uh, so we know that if we have a current I, that current must create a magnetic field B. So let's say I have a battery connected to a coil of wire. Um, by having these wires all point in the same direction, so that the current all points in the same direction, uh, that's essentially what you get when you coil the wire, wire together. Uh, we can create an even bigger magnetic field uh, because all of these currents are pointing in the same direction. It's like we have an even bigger current than when we started with. So we can use that to create a very large magnetic field, B. Let me write down in white just to make sure it shows up on the camera. Uh, coils of wire can be used to create larger magnetic fields. What direction does a current carrying wire create a magnetic field? Well, we have here uh, a wire that will be carrying some current. Uh, and it's just going to go down around this way to the right and back up again. We can tell this because you can see we've got a positive lead over here connected uh, right on this end of the wire and the black lead, that's the negative end connecting on this side, so that the current's going to go down and around like this. Within this loop it's going to be going uh, counterclockwise. So we're going to measure the direction of the magnetic field uh, by simply using a compass and holding the compass at different locations. So right now you can see my compass, uh, if I hold it here, north is kind of up in a that way direction. And I'm just going to turn my current on here and we're going to see what happens here. So now you can see right when I put the compass in there my compass needle flips so that my magnetic field is pointing in the opposite direction. Now it's pointing down this way and if I actually go below the compass needle or go below the current carrying wire you can see that now the magnetic field is pointing this way. So it's pointing toward us, toward the camera if I'm above the wire, and below the wire, it's pointing uh, away from the camera. So what's going on here? One of the important uh, questions you are going to have to answer in this course is which direction does the magnetic field point uh, for a given direction of the current? So we just showed current pointing to the right, and we showed that the magnetic field above the wire uh, came out toward you, and the magnetic field below was going uh, in uh, into the board as I've drawn it over here. So over here, it's out of the board, and over here, underneath the wire, it was into the board. Now, in physics, we have a nice shorthand for, because uh, we don't want to write out out of the board, into the board. We have a shorthand 
Uh, and you can imagine that the shorthand comes from just drawing a little green arrow over here. Now, if that arrow is coming uh, toward me, so if it's coming out of the page, all I'm going to do is see the point of the arrow. So we're going to represent that by a circle with a dot coming through it. So that will mean coming out at you. But if the arrow is going away from you, what you're going to see is the back end of the arrow. So you're going to see the, um, the little tail on here, which we're going to represent by a circle with an X. So the circle with an X means into the board. A circle with a dot means out of the board coming at you. Now, why is it that we would have magnetic field coming out at you up top and into the board underneath? Well, it's fairly simple. Uh, if you get a few more points to figure out what the magnetic field is doing. And it turns out we can draw this very easily if I just rotate my wire this way. So pretend I grab my wire and then I rotate it 90 degrees. So now the wire is coming, pointing at you, and it's coming out. So I'm gonna, I can do the same thing with the current. Here's the current pointing out at you. And all I've done is I've rotated it 90 degrees towards you this way. So I'm gonna do the same thing with the magnetic field. So that this magnetic field, which was pointing this way, is gonna rotate 90 degrees. So now, uh, this magnetic field is pointing this way. And this magnetic field, again, we're just rotating it 90 degrees. So my, my current would rotate at 90 degrees this way, I'm going to rotate the magnetic field this way. The magnetic field on the bottom is going like that. And if I got a few more points, what you'd see is that the magnetic field does this. And in fact, what it's doing is it's looping around. So the magnetic field loops around the wire. Now this is a little different than what we're used to for electric fields. Electric fields go off forever and ever. They start at a positive, they end at a negative. Magnetic fields loop around in a cycle. They're going around in a, some sort of circle. And the way to tell which way the magnetic field is, is we're going to use something called the right hand rule. Raise your right hand. Make sure it's your right hand. I am left-handed, I have a propensity to accidentally do my left hand, so I always have to check which hand I'm working with. This is the right hand rule. So what you do is you're going to just pretend you're grabbing the wire. So here's my wire. Grab your wire. Now, uh, you're going to grab the wire in such a way that your thumb is pointing in the direction that the current is moving. So I could grab the wire this way, or I could grab the wire this way. Both ways work. However, only one way has my thumb pointing along the current. Okay, so I want my thumb pointing along the current, I've got to hold the wire this way. If I grab the wire this way, my thumb points to the left, but the current points to the right, so that doesn't work. So we're going to grab the wire this way. Now you'll notice that your fingers curl around the wire. Uh, your non-thumb fingers curl around the wire. And they're going to curl around in exactly the same direction that the magnetic field curls around. So my fingers, if I grab the wire like this, are coming out up top, but then, <coughs> excuse me, um, too much chalk dust. Uh, if I grab it this way, again, thumb's still pointing in the direction to the, to the right, same direction as the current, but they'll curl underneath so that the, my fingers are kind of curling around like this around the wire, they'll come out up top and then in underneath. I can do the same thing over here. Again, I just grab my wire, point my thumb in the direction of the current, so again, Circle dot means out of the board. Uh, I can't put my, I can't grab the wire this way because then my thumb is pointing into the board and I want it to point with the current out of the board. Again, my fingers curl around in the direction that the magnetic field goes and in this case, that's just going to be counterclockwise. So we can use this right hand rule to figure out what the direction of the magnetic field is going to point we can see that I can either have counterclockwise, uh, a counterclockwise direction for the magnetic field uh, if my current's pointing out of the page. However, if my current's going into the page, the magnetic field, again, just grab the wire, use the right hand rule, point your thumb in the direction, into the board, because that's the direction that the current moves. Then my fingers curl around like this, so the magnetic field 
has to curl around like that as well in the clockwise direction. So the direction of the magnetic field uh, just depends on the right hand rule. And it'll be different depending on whether the current is going into the page or out of the page. No matter which way the current's going, you can always just pretend you're grabbing the wire and then the direction that your fingers are going, as long as your thumb is pointing in the direction of the current, the direction that your fingers curl around that wire is going to be the direction of the magnetic field. So again, there's only two rules. Grab the wire, pretend you're grabbing the wire, with your thumb pointing in the direction of the current. So if the current's going in, you grab the wire with your thumb pointing in, and then your fingers uh, will curl around, or the magnetic field will curl around in the same direction as your fingers. It's the only two steps for doing the right hand rule. Pretend you're grabbing the wire, point your thumb in the direction that the current's going, and in whatever direction your fingers curl, that's the direction of the magnetic field. So that's the direction of the magnetic field. How large is the magnetic field? Well, we can write the size of the magnetic field using Ampere's law. In Ampere's law, measures the magnetic field at some distance r, some radial distance r, away from the wire. So if you have a very long straight wire, then your magnetic field will have a magnitude given by mu naught, that's the Greek letter mu with a subscript zero, times the current i, so more current gives you more magnetic field. If you have no current, you're not going to have any magnetic field. Divided by 2 pi, um, and one more thing goes into this. We expect that the further away you get from the wire, the weaker the magnetism is going to be. So we divide by R over here. So the magnetic field equals mu naught times the current divided by 2 pi times R. Uh, and that mu naught is a constant. Mu naught equals 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7, Tesla meters per ampere, where you should remember that an ampere is the unit of current. So that when I plug into that mu naught uh, and multiply by a current, say 3 amps, the amperes will cancel. The meters from R will cancel with the meters from the mu naught. Uh, so that you'll just get Tesla, which is the units of magnetic field. To get a sense for the different sizes and different magnitudes of magnetic fields, uh, it's helpful to go through a few different examples. So we know Earth has a magnetic field. Uh, its magnetic field in Tesla is going to be about 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. Uh, so that's a fairly weak magnetic field, but it's enough to turn a compass needle. Uh, if you contrast that with a refrigerator magnet, so these are just the magnets that you stick on your refrigerator, uh, those have a magnetic field of about, of about 5 times uh, 10 to the minus 3, so that's about 100 times bigger than Earth's magnetic field. If I go 1,000 times bigger than uh, a refrigerator magnet, uh, you get something close to an MRI that's about 3 Tesla. Uh, that's enough to uh, erase the magnetic strip on your credit card. So it's enough to erase your credit card uh, if you're within a few feet of that. So that's usually why if you go into a, a room that has an NMR or uh, an MRI machine, they ask you to leave all your credit cards and uh, jewelry and any pieces of metal uh, away because you could cause serious damage. Obviously, if you have like a, an earring uh, that has some iron in it that's loosely magnetic, you can, uh, if it's a strong enough attraction that could rip right out of your ear, um, higher than that is a superconducting magnet, uh, which gets up to about 10 Tesla. That's getting close to the limit of what we can uh, produce uh, on the Earth magnetic field-wise. It's about 10 to 20 Tesla uh, magnets, uh, magnetic fields. 